BBC Two was the first television network in this country to go into colour, not because it was a, had such a wonderful track record, but because uh, it was the last to be introduced in 1969 after BBC One and ITV, um, and it was introduced on a new technical standard of 625 lines as against 405 lines. Um, I was controller of BBC Two at the time, um, and it was my job to devise programmes that were going to be seen in colour, and which would, as it were, sell colour. Um, and one of the ideas I had uh, was that we should put together all the loveliest things that Western civilization had created in, since the last 2,000 years, um, and, and show them in colour. A ravishing, a ravishing cavalcade of beautiful things was my idea, a very obvious idea. Um, and putting it in uh, chronological order was uh, an obvious idea too. I had no hesitation at all uh, in uh, recruiting Kenneth Clark uh, to make the first series of these coloured documentaries, which we call Civilization. Um, and that was a huge success, uh, beyond anybody's imagination, certainly beyond mine. Three months, 13 programmes in which you took a great slab of, of human experience and, and said implicitly to viewers, now look, here you are, we're going to take this seriously, we're going to start at the beginning, we're going to go to the end, uh, it won't hurt, <laughs> but at the end of it, you will have had, uh, uh, you'll have been taken by the hand by someone who's a great expert, and you will have a, a really good working knowledge of that great part of life. Um, well, it was a huge success, as I said. So much so that the head of science, or rather head of, of, of uh, the whole section of factual programming called Aubrey Singer, in, which included uh, science, and Aubrey's particular enthusiasm was science, um, Aubrey steamed into my office uh, uh, quite soon after civilization had started, saying this was an absolute scandal. I was supposed to be, he said, you're supposed to be a scientist. You're supposed to have got a degree in zoology, and you sit there in your controller's chair, and you give this great budget and this wonderful out thing to arts. What are you playing at? We must do science. Well, he was quite right, of course, we must do science. Though science, to start with, was not at all as obvious a subject as civilization had been. I mean, for a start, it did not, didn't involve necessarily a whole lot of beautiful things. Um, and secondly, uh, that it, uh, it didn't deal with, with material objects in that sort of sense. It dealt with theory, and there were great slabs of theory. How are you going to put those across? I mean, that's not an obvious winner for the audience either. In fact, though, uh, the American Bicentennial uh, was coming up. Um, and uh, th this new format of 13, 50-minute segments was now the sort of flavour of the month. So everybody was very keen that we sh the next one should actually be um, Alistair Cook talking about the history of America, because Alistair Cook is a great, great sound broadcaster. And although people didn't know it at the time in Britain, he also had an, uh, an established persona in, in American television, introducing British dramas, period dramas, costume dramas. Um, and he is a marvellous broadcaster. Um, so I was very happy that BBC Two should do that, to move on to uh, into the 70, in 1973, I think. Um, and for a number of reasons. One, it, it would bring in the Americans, which we were quite happy to do. Um, and two, that it gave us more time to think about the ascent of man and how we're going to plot it. And Aubrey was quite clear. Um, there's, there's Bruno, he said. Now, Bruno was the way that everybody uh, I knew talked about Dr. Jacob Bronowski. Um, and he was a big figure, not on television, but on radio. There was a Brains Trust a program, which had the great brains. I mean, they really qualified as great brains. <laughs> Um, and, and Bruno was one of the big stars uh, of the Brains Trust. I don't think anybody knew what he looked like, actually, and, and indeed, um, maybe that's as well, because he, at first sight, he was, I mean, he was very, a very short man, but he had burning eyes and burning conviction, and he talked 
with a burning passion and intensity which, which really absolutely gripped you. And I think it was probably him who decided that in order to bring some kind of coherence into science, which is after all one way of looking at the world, that he would look at it historically and saw how human beings and the human mind and human thought moved into more and more uh, approaching towards the, the essentials of reality, uh, working out the laws of nature. He saw that as a historical progress. Um, but there was another thing about Bruno, and that is that not only was he a, a, a remarkable historian of science and practicing scientist, he was also a poet. Uh, he was an expert on Blake. Uh, he had written poetry himself. He had written literary criticism of Blake. And he had a feeling for language and a feeling for narrative. He, he told stories marvellously. And he was also an actor. I mean, he, he had a, a grasp of narrative timing, um, which was comparable to that of a really great actor. And if you're going to do this kind of program, you have to uh, uh, be able to repeat some particular introduction over and over again. And Bruno, together with Adrian Malone and Mick Jackson, who were the two directors, saw this thing as, as a series of dramatic um, statements. And Bruno wasn't one just to sit there and talk. Uh, Bruno would d decide that he really had to do uh, uh, rather complicated movements uh, in which he would suddenly, at one particular moment, come up against a statue of some kind, which would, just at the moment in his speech that was relevant, and then he'd move on and maybe look in the mid-distance and, and then go on and do it. Now, he did that, would do that again and again. And above all, he was a great master of the hesitation. Uh, he had a, an ability to just pause and look up to the sort of mid-distance, as though he was desperately trying to find this one word out of the whole complexity of the English language, which is going to summarise what he really meant. And it was like forcing it out. And he'd had you on the edge of your seat. He had all those talents, but he also had um, a marvellous ability for visualisation. Uh, there is a sequence in which he talks about crystals, dextro and levo rotatory crystals. Um, now, I suppose if you started to think about that, he would you would start with a crystal, wouldn't you? Something that had that kind of symmetry, left-handed and right-handed. He started in uh, Moorish tiles in, I think, the Alhambra. And he speaks of this and, and, and uses these wonderful tiles in an absolutely astonishing way, uh, which really holds you. But having said all that, he was also capable of doing just one take. And one take it was just it was straight off the cuff. Uh, he went to one of the concentration camps uh, at the end of the war, where so many of the Jewish people had been murdered, his people. Um, and quite unpreparedly, he knelt down beside a pool, which he realized contained the ashes of thousand Jews and spoke. Well, he didn't rehearse that and he didn't repeat it. These things inevitably take time. Uh, they're uh, e even an average documentary uh, takes about three months to do from beginning to end. I mean, there are some that you can shoot of um, about one day at the cup final or something, which obviously doesn't take that time. But if you're going to take a considered subject, three months is not unreasonable. And if you're going to do a series of 13, uh, three years um, is, is pretty reasonable too. 
Um, and so w we didn't have to hurry uh, about getting uh, a centre man off the air, which was on the air, which was I think probably just as well, because it was um, a very difficult concept to get hold of. It involved a lot of research, even for Bruno, who, as it were, knew everything, um, and also was working together uh, with uh, Mick Jackson and Adrian Malone to work out where they were going to get um, the sort of sequences that they needed. It took time. When it was finished, I think in many ways it was um, probably a, a, a greater achievement in that, that, that the problem of tackling theoretical concepts that, that Bruno did throughout that was a, with no immediately obvious visual material was a very difficult one to grapple with. Um, but, but Bruno's burning um, personality, I mean, the intensity of his vision, comes through uh, so powerfully that when Hugh Weldon, who was then a controller of programme, director of television, he was, I think, uh, saw it, he said, that is an affirmation. Uh, and I think what he meant was that it was an affirmation about mankind. Um, it was an affirmation of standards of scientific uh, probity um, and scientific probing and scientific uh, concentration, um, which is paramount, a paramount quality in civilization. Oddly, science uh, is central, and although it wasn't called civilization, it's also about civilization. I can't remember how old uh, Bruno was when he took on uh, this task, but he was not a young man. Uh, I don't think he was um, a strong man, but he desperately wanted to do it. I mean, he was really, uh, he didn't need a lot of persuasion because he knew, I'm sure, that he had it in him. Uh, this was a vision of human progress and the progress of human knowledge, which he had and which he wanted to share. Um, and it was uh, quite soon after the series was finished uh, that he died. Um, he, he lived long enough to know that it was a great series. He lived long enough to know uh, that it was a, a major milestone in television. Um, and I, I believe he was gratified. And I'm sure that he, he saw it as one of the things that he really wished to achieve with his life.